in business and uh and now man i always look back at your video you were uh 20 at the time yeah yeah young very young 20 i turned 24 on monday so i just turned 24 happy birthday yeah, time's man. flying thank you i appreciate you yeah time's flying man what were you moment, man, when you came here uh what, what, what year was i 2021 no no i think i was a i was I want to say sophomore year. Yeah, sophomore year. Just finished sophomore year. Yeah, just finished sophomore year going to junior year because it was that that weird COVID season. But then um, because of COVID, I mean, I got my fifth year, which allowed me to get my um, MBA. So I was there for another year. And are, are, so, you, are you graduating right now or are you doing your master's? Yeah, I finished my master's in um, December. So I've graduated. I did all of it in about uh, four and a half years. I did the undergrad and the master's in four and a half because they just kept I mean, it was a grind, man. They had me in school 24-7 from, like, my freshman year. Like, summers were never off. It was summer schooled and fall schooled. But, I mean, at the end of the day, like, four and a half years of my life got it all done. So, I'm thankful for that. And imagine and then like, I took, like, credits every, every semester. Yeah, it was a it was a lot for sure. And then trying to fill it all in, too, just with summer soccer and USL2 and all that good stuff. And, I mean, all in all, like, all of a sudden done five and a half years, I think, from my time out of academy because I took a gap year for a little bit. And then I was figuring things out and then after that, but I'm sure we'll get more into all those details once, uh, once we get going in this conversation, I'll, I'll save, save all the details. Yeah. Let me ask everybody to put their cameras on so you can see their faces and For sure. they can introduce themselves, uh, you know, so you get to know them a little bit, what they do, mm -hmm. what they add, what's their plan. And then we can start the conversation. So please, Joshua, Alan, Camilo, you guys that are already there, can you please introduce yourself to Kendall? To Carson Kendall. I always call yeah, you. Yeah, no. I it's it's you okay. That's happened in my whole life. Two first names. <laughs> Joshua, Alan, can you guys start, please? Hi, good night. Good night. Um, my name is Joshua Cordero. Um, I'm currently in Iowa at a community college. Um, we play D2, um, and the community college is named Southeastern Community College, and I play as a winger, right or left. Southeastern, is your, uh, is your, is your mascot the Black uh, Hawks? Or, yeah. Yeah, uh, on yeah so one of, my, yeah. One, of my, one of my teammates, uh, actually two of my teammates for the Virgin Islands national team, they played there, Jimson St. Louis and uh, Whelan, they both played there, and now they're both at D1 schools. So uh, he was number Jimson, Jimson. Yeah, Jimson's at Coastal Carolina now, and Whelan's at Iowa Western. Wait, something like that. Iowa Western or something like that. But, yeah, no, good guys. Yeah, good guys for sure. Well, uh, Not a bad my, spot to be at. Uh, I've seen y'all. Y'all have, have a lot of success. Sorry, go ahead. So, go ahead. <laughs> uh, my name's Alan. Um, um, as well, I'm in Iowa, so Dethan Community College, and mm -hmm. I'm a midfielder. Oh, very cool. Sweet. Camilo? Hi, my name is Camilo. I'm from the American Republic as well. Uh, I'm a center back, and I'm playing for a group called D2 called Blackhawk College. Very cool. Yeah. Eduardo? Uh, hello, my name is Eduardo. Uh, I'm currently a senior uh, in a boarding school in the United States, and I play midfielder. Nice. What boarding school? Uh, Perkyoma School in Pennsylvania. Okay. Cold. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> Hi, my name is Adriana Gomez. I am a center back, and I am currently at a D3 school in, in Massachusetts. Very nice. Very cold. Axel? Hello, my name is Axel Ricard. I currently play for Connexus uh, Community School here in Dominican Republic and also with Barca Academy. I play as a left back, a left fullback, and right fullback. Felipe? Um, hi, my name is Felipe. I'm a sophomore in Carroll Morgan School here in the DR, and I'm a goalkeeper. So, yeah. Now that everybody introduced, am I missing someone? I know somebody joined, but it's Zoom user. So I don't know uh, who is that. If you can please introduce yourself or put your camera on, please. Uh, 
but yeah, right now, uh, Harrison, they all want to, you know, follow your steps. They they want to become they want to become college athletes. Some of them are already uh, college athletes. So I would like to start by asking you a couple questions and just sure. letting you talk about how was your process of going from high school to college soccer and what were what were the challenges that you faced and how did you overcome those challenges? Yeah, I mean, great place to start. So um, if y'all don't know, I'm Carson Kendall. Um, I played at High Point University, I'm 24 years old now, but I'm originally from St. Thomas in the US Virgin Islands, which is a, uh, if you don't know about it, it's a very, very small island in the Caribbean, maybe like 60,000 people live on it. But uh, yeah, I mean, growing up in the Caribbean, it's uh, a bit challenging to to kind of get into the mainstream soccer part and things like that, as I'm sure a lot of you have uh, been able to see and things like that. But I mean, the Dominican Republic's a bit bigger, so I'm sure there's a little bit more of an opportunity. But for me, the way my story started is uh, I grew up playing soccer in St. Thomas and uh, just through hard work, I just got better and better playing with people older than me. I ended up playing inside of the men's league uh, when I was about 14, 15. And uh, inside of that men's league, I started becoming one of the better players. Um, at that same time, we had a uh, a new national team coach who um, spouse, kind of scouted me and uh, decided that the best route for me was to move to the States uh, or move to a different club uh, across the world. So I um, ended up leaving home when I was 15 years old uh, to go on some trials. I uh, was supposed to trial at uh, Real Salt Lake, um, which is an MLS team, Hoffenheim, which is a uh, Bundesliga team, and uh, Sporting Kansas City, uh, which is another MLS team. Uh, the first team I trialed for was uh, Sporting Kansas City, and I ended up uh, getting a great offer from them to kind of signing a, signing a spot on their academy. So, I mean, it just made the most sense for me to stay there. So at 15 years old, I moved up to Kansas City and played for Sporting Kansas City's Academy, um, which is back in the days, it was USDA, which is was the highest level of youth soccer inside of uh, the country. Um, I left my home. I left my family when I was 15. I lived with a host family from the age of 15 to uh, 19, all in the hopes of uh, hopes of playing high-level soccer. And I mean, it's probably one of the best decisions that uh, I've ever done in my life because it all paid out in spades. But at the same time, there was a multitude of challenges of doing so, which I'm sure uh, some of you guys are facing. I mean, I think there was a couple of people who said they were in boarding schools right now. It's hard to leave home and hard to uh, kind of go off on your own. And I mean, the challenges for me was just adapting to the level of soccer in the U.S. Uh, when I first left St. Thomas, I was probably one of the best players on the island, regardless of like age, playing with the uh, grown men and things like that. So I had a bit of a head on my shoulders and a bit of cockiness. And then When I went to the States, it's uh, one of those things where I was a big fish in a small pond and I turned out to be a minnow inside of a, a massive ocean. So just adapting to the level of play, adapting to the level of tactics, level of professionalism and all that that I just never experienced before. But I mean, thankfully, uh, thankfully, I was able to get my head on straight and able to uh, to really adapt to the culture. I mean, it didn't come without its challenges. It, uh, it took me a while to uh, really get up to speed tactically and technically. I mean, thankfully, I was a big 15 year old I was about six two and like 190 pounds at 15 so that's kind of what was my saving grace and uh yeah I mean just through hard work I managed to continue playing and then I started playing well and through that I started playing and training with uh the first team and the USL championship team and um I actually was uh kind of uh, gearing up to sign a contract with them when I ended up getting injured I injured my shoulder I was out for about six six and a half months and during that time um uh, So they went with a different option. That was during my gap year time. I went with a different option and signed somebody. And that's how I ended up going to college. I ended up signing to High Point University, which is an NCAA Division I school. And uh, I felt like it was the right choice for me. I mean, there were some other schools I was talking to. But um, it just felt like the project that they wanted to build there and the community they wanted to build there and, like, uh, the goals they wanted to build there were all what I wanted to be a part of. I wanted to be the part of a uh, kind of building something. And I think it's uh, – It all paid off in spades because, I mean, I had probably some of the best five years anyone can have in college soccer. I mean, we won five trophies, championships, nationally ranked, top 25, top 20 team. I mean, it was a it was like a movie. I mean, it, we went from transforming a team from not being the most highly sought after team to one of the best mid-major programs inside of the country. And I'm something I held my uh, held my uh my hat on and at the same time i mean i also got a top-notch education and i mean it just allowed me to really 
I mean, I, I mean, it, it was one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. The past five years, half a decade was really incredible for me, not only as a person, but as a, as a person to grow mentally and uh, mature as well. So that's kind of my story and how I got to this point. And yeah, I finished that up in December. I uh, finished my master's degree. So I graduated with my uh, master's in business administration, um, finished that up. And uh, yeah, now I'm here. I mean, it's been a good ride. That's awesome, man, for real. And knowing that you were part of the national team as well, how did that make you feel? You know, being a college I mean, athlete yeah. then being the captain of the national team. Yeah, I mean, it was, as as far as levels, uh, the Virgin Islands national team, I mean, it's not like it's the U.S. soccer or something like that. But, I mean, at the same time, it was the greatest honor I've ever had to captain my national team and to have that trust uh, as a uh, – as a um, as one of the younger players on the team, I think I was 21 when I got the armband. It was, I mean, it was one of the biggest honors in my life to be able to lead this team and lead, uh, lead everybody to, uh, to what we were doing and things like that. And I mean, just being a part of that while also being a college student. I mean, it's like, I lived two, uh, two different lives, but at the same time, they're both intertwined. And thankfully, like I said, like my coach at high point was very, uh, very accommodating with it as well. We always tried to make time to, uh, allow me to go on national duty, whether that was workarounds or fly out from a different uh, different location. I'd, be, I'd play a game in, against somebody and then they would take me to the airport, drop me off, and then I'd go from there to, uh, to wherever I needed to fly off to. So he was, uh, he was a very, very big uh, help inside of that because I know a lot of my teammates who did play college soccer, it was a bit uh, rough trying to figure out that accommodation. But I mean, my coach and we have a great relationship and he really uh, allowed me to, to kind of live the best of both worlds. So I mean, playing on the national team too is one of the greatest honors you can ever have. It's something that barely anybody else, any, barely anybody can do inside of their life. And I mean, it's something that I'll remember with my time being there for the rest of my life. So You're definitely about super, super cool. Excuse me? Are you talking about Jiva? Uh, no, my coach at college, I mean, Jiva was super accommodating as well. They're both super accommodating. But my coach at college was a, uh, was a saint with allowing me to travel because realistically, like, it's always in season that somehow lines up against the CONCACAF window and college soccer seasons are super, super quick. If you haven't, haven't, haven't been part of them. I mean, they, they're, they're games every like four days pretty much. So he allowed me to do that. And then Jeeva at the same time was super accommodating as well. He, uh, he allowed me to come in late if I needed to. And just was, uh, I mean, they both made it a very, very easy process because I know it could have been difficult if uh either of them kind of rested their heads on their on their egos but it was a lot of humility and a lot of grace from both sides and I mean, i'm very thankful for that that's that's a really nice point and that's something that i wanted to ask you as well how does a good relationship with a coach like that or how does that make you feel as a player when you have that confidence from that from the coach you know how do you achieve that mm -hmm. sometimes you know you're struggling a bit you might not get the results that you want but you want to earn that you know trust from your coach how do you do that yeah i mean having your trust from the coach is i mean it's one of the most important things if you really want to be successful inside of any team that you're on because at the end of the day like that coach is going to make the decision of who plays and who doesn't play and uh at the same time this the coaches i mean they're there to make sure that the team's doing the best that they can so i mean the best way i could i would say to build the trust for a relationship with the coach is just to be the best person on and off the field that you can be show them that you're worth having that trust. And that doesn't just mean being the best player on the field, like the most talented player. It means helping out with the equipment after. I and mean, if you're in college, getting the grades together, making sure that you never have to be a problem or things like that. And also just holding yourself to high standard and holding those around you to high standard. The best thing about leaders are they lead by example. And I mean, you can't be a leader if you're not doing the right thing. And then it seems like coaches seem to gravitate towards, gravitate towards the people who are leading themselves and, and then naturally those just become the leaders of others. And at that same time, you'd get built into the coach's good graces. Cause I mean, for me, after my first year of college, like me and my coach, we never had to really worry about anything to get, he always trusted me. If I needed to tell him something like, Hey, like coach, like I can't be here. I really can't be at this because of this. Like it's not, he's never going to be a question. He's going to be like, Oh, is he playing me? Because we built that trust together. Same thing with Jibo, my national team coach. It's like, if I'm telling him something, it's it's out of all honesty because he knows that I'm never going to lie to him and I know that he's going to give me his honest feedback. So it's just a level of uh, level of trust and commitment between both of you and, I mean, a level of uh, a level of honesty between between each other that it gets built over time by showing them and being a good example. So, I mean, that's the best way I could say that. Just lead yourself to be the best version of yourself and then 
everything seems to naturally follow suit after that. That's awesome, man. Really nice. Really nice answer. I also have a question. When we met you, you we could tell that you were a leader. Were you like that all the time or did you work on your leadership to get there? No, nah, man. I mean, I think I think the saying natural born leaders are a little played out because I'm sure there's people who are born to be leaders or something like that, have a little bit maybe a little bit more of a oomph inside of them. But at the same time, I think leadership is something that's a uh, that's a lifelong journey and a lifelong task of just trying to better yourself. Because for me, when I was living in St. Thomas, especially when I was younger, like early high school, ninth grade things like that, like my cockiness and my attitude and my mentality, I would say I was never a leader. Like, I mean, I was very good at soccer. So that allowed me to, allowed me to have that kind of leader role. But at the end of the day, that's not a leader. And then once I moved to Kansas City, the maturity that I gained from just being there and being inside of that developmental program, being around pros, being around MLS players, USL championship players, like they really are the ones who taught me how to lead because there's the guy who's really good at soccer and then just yells at everybody every time they mess up. And that's not a leader. That's just somebody who's uh, condescending. And then there's a the guy who puts their shoulder arm around somebody's shoulder who's having a hard time and lifts them up around you and then carries themselves and makes sure that they're helping out too, that they could be a a five-year veteran, but they're still picking up the picking up the equipment afterwards. So I think, I mean, and that wasn't only, I didn't only learn leadership on the field, just off the field as well, just being part of these classes and being around people inside of college, especially, you just really have to keep yourself on a good example and keep yourself moving forward and like when I say be the best version of yourself that doesn't just mean being on the field being the best version of yourself that means being in the classroom you're you're being at you're being there you're being adamant you're asking questions you're being good at school things like that I feel like there's a good saying that that I, I try to live my life by it's how you do anything is how you do everything and I think that's just a big a big step to being a leader because when you wake up and you go out, you can't have one part of your life be, oh, I'm like a good leader at soccer, all that. And then like, say you're in college and you're going to school and you're just kind of blowing it off. Like that's, you can't, you can never be a leader. Your whole life has to be kind of an, an intertwined energy. And I think that's a process that gets built over time. And in every, every medium, whether that's a job or school or soccer, you just learn how to be a better and better leader. And I mean, every day is an opportunity to improve yourself. Like even now, I don't think I'll ever be the finished product of who I am, whether that's moving into the corporate world, which I'm doing right now. I don't think I'm ever going to be the finished product five years from now of like, okay, I'm the perfect leader now. I think it's just a continuous process of uh, making sure that you're always developing and always uh, checking in with yourself, making sure that you're uh, always on the right path and leading yourself and leading others around you. Man, great answer. Great answer. And I, I appreciate think that. Thank you. That's what they need to hear, you know, they they are all all of the athletes here they are great players but they mm -hmm. still need to work on that mentality and still work on that leadership and i think that the answer that you gave is just it's, it, there's no better way to describe it you know and thank you i appreciate it i was going to ask you as well now that you mentioned that you're going to the corporate world how did soccer help you to get there and you know, how's that process of transitioning from college soccer to, you know, get a job now or, you know, start your own? Yeah. How, how does yeah, that work? No, I mean, for sure. I mean, soccer is – soccer, the way I like to put it in sports in general, is a little bit of a microcosm of life itself. I mean, you're on a field, especially in soccer, but you're on a field with 11 people, 20 people on your team, and you're trying to go towards this goal of being the best versions of yourself all the time and building a championship team and things like that. I mean, throughout it, you have to work together. It's communication skills. It's teamwork skills. It's problem-solving skills. I mean, how many times have y'all been on a soccer field where you, like the easiest thing to do is just to blow up at somebody or yell at somebody or have your emotions take over? Soccer kind of teaches you about how to handle things. I mean, I'm sure right now, especially with the people I've talked to, the recruiters I've talked to is like, I'm equipped to be inside of that corporate world, working inside of team environments. I know how to talk to people. I know how to get deadlines done. I know how to meet like meet standards when there's pressure on because of these things. I know how to, I know how to lead others. Like, you know how I was saying with it, like it's all, it's all intertwined. I mean, it's really just something that allows you to grow as a person, I mean, holistically as a person, like you learn a lot of life lessons being on the soccer field. I know for the past five years, even from my ninth grade, I mean, not my ninth grade, excuse me, my freshman year of college to my graduate student year, the way I handled problems, the way I talked to people, the way I was able to uh, 
be able to handle the pressure when like things got like heavier or things got heated or like say we were in kind of a losing slump and things like that it all increased and it all got better thankfully because I was able to have all those practice experiences and all those game experiences with the people around me and kind of build these relationships and build the way I talk to people and build the way I do things and I mean now I feel like I feel wholly confident. I can't say I can't say it's going to be hundred percent because I haven't worked in the corporate world yet. But I mean, after the degrees I've earned and, and the the relationships I built on and off the field and the the different abilities and soft skills I built on and off the field, I think I think I'm ready to kind of tackle anything. So I mean, I'm excited for the next challenge. I'm excited to see where it goes. And uh, I mean, just like anything in life, uh, there's different phases of it, and I'm really excited to see where this next phase of my life goes. And I'm I'm really thankful for soccer and and sports in general for all it taught me kind of building up to it. Well, do you have any other questions before we we start with the boys and girls questions? Yeah, I uh, I I was reading over the questions and uh, to make good use of Carson's time, I kind of mixed some and I think out of the twelve we got, I'll I'll try to ask five because I think you've answered uh, most of them. And then we open up the the conversation to anyone that has a direct question to you, obviously, that they have you here on the call. But um, and I just want to recap on everything you've said. Um, they even like reached me as an entrepreneur, former athlete, and more than anything, a an international athlete where coming from an island, um, everything you're saying I know you have the U.S. passport, but you had to prove that you were not a big, a uh, big fish in a small pond. And I think that is one of the hardest uh, feats that we can ever face as an athlete and as a person, because uh, we were uh, we're probably a bigger island than the USBI, but we're also a small island in comparison mm -hmm. to the world. And I think a lot of us and a lot of these athletes that we have here, they don't really dimension, they don't, they can't really put into perspective what they're going to face until they're there. So listening to you talk so profoundly about leadership, talk so, I would say so real in terms of your words, I, I hope that everyone listening can really put themselves in your shoes uh, because it's something that now you probably have not been in the corporate world but I know everything you've learned from sports in the field, outside of the field, in the classroom are things you're basically going to carry your entire life. And uh, I listened to your words and I also met you when you were 20 and uh, you were part of the senior national team. And for me, you were one of the real leaders. And I, I, I saw it when I saw the training sessions. You really were that guy carrying, carrying the material. You were really were that guy pushing your 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 teammates during every exercise you were you were that guy and i think the leader that doesn't have to say they're a leader is a real leader because they share with their actions so uh really really glad to just listen to you man uh and congratulate you because again like all of us we grew grew up in a small pond and we usually think that we are the big fish but then when once we get out there is when we really realize that uh we're pretty small and there's fish maybe they're not bigger than us but they're just in a big pond so that gives them a competitive advantage for sure for sure man i mean yeah, yeah. that's the you, you said it you said it perfectly like leadership and when you can be considered a leader and you're not the one going around telling everybody hey i'm a leader hey i'm a leader that's when you know that you're doing something right Yes. And uh, well, I wanted to first start off, Carson, we uh, have not only our sports leadership class, but we have a book club, which where mm -hmm. we are trying to really incite the habit of reading and personal development into our members, because we know how important it is. And obviously listening to you talk about leadership, I'm sure you've done your work of passing pages mm -hmm. to the left. So mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts on reading if you have the habit, when did you pick up the habit or what other personal development habits you have in terms of listening to podcasts, attending seminars and uh, regarding all those habits, what has been the impact, impact it has had on you as an athlete, as a person? And if you are reading a book, what book are you currently reading? 
Okay, perfect. I mean, yeah, no. So reading is something that I would say is a super, super important part of my life now. And uh, funny enough, when I really started picking back up the habit of reading, it's when I met you guys in the DR. It was, uh, I was going through a rough period of time in my life. Me and my girlfriend of uh, about three and a half years at the time broke up. So I was just kind of doing a bit of like finding myself and things like that. And I was reading the, the book, uh, Think Like a Monk at the time. By Jay Shetty, which I highly recommend. It's a super good book just about thought process and wisdom and things like 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 that by an actual a guy who actually went to monk training and things like that, just the way you can change your mindset and change your brain. But uh, reading is a super, super, super important habit. I mean, I continued reading through there. And then my girlfriend now, she is a, uh, she's a super reader. She reads all the time. So I definitely have picked up the habit a bit more from her as well. And I mean, she recommends me good books and I read that read read those i read books that i i find interesting i read books on finance i read books on leadership i read books on just different like mental stimulation and mental um uh you know like philosophy books and things like that because i think it's important to kind of have a broad spectrum of it because there's a lot of different interesting little pieces of wisdom you can learn from books that aren't even supposed to be quote unquote about leadership like a philosophy book that i that i've um that i've uh read is um Siddhartha Siddhartha Erman essay which is just a book about uh call it Siddhartha but it's a book about the about the Buddha as as you can tell I'm kind of into the into the into the Buddhist mindset and things like that but it's a book about the Buddha and it's a story about how he uh kind of went on to find uh find himself which is another book that's chock full of lessons uh podcast I listen to a bunch of podcasts ranging from you know just light comedy podcasts to interview podcasts like Joe Rogan or um Diary of a CEO, things like that. Just really good podcasts that just kind of keep you entertained, hearing from different really powerful people. I mean, because I think it's always super important to kind of hear the perspective of people who are successful and kind of how they got there, what they did, things like that. Just kind of pick their brain because I mean, at the end of the day, there's no direct ladder to success. So, like there's not just this is the one way you can be successful. There's people who do it a multitude of different ways and it's kind of a choose your own adventure book, but you, you can take the best, uh, the best parts of those interviews and those podcasts and things like that and just kind of translate them to your life. I think it's super important. Um, one of the best, but one of the best books I've read lately, um, uh, super easy read, super quick read. My now girlfriend got it for me. It's called make your bed. Um, it's by, a uh, by, a, um, a retired Navy, uh, Navy, uh, veteran, but it's just super simple habits that he learned inside of um, Navy SEAL training that just allowed him to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, I guess, be successful. Another good book I read lately, uh, which is another one my girlfriend got me now. So, I mean, as you can tell, she's a positive influence on my life. She, uh, she got me um, one called, I think it's eight, it's seven or eight um, key principle leadership skills uh, from a life at Disney. And it's a, uh, it's a book from the former, um, uh, executive vice president of Disney and their operations and how they make such a mom momentous uh, business grow and how they kind of had all those standards set, which is, is something super important going into the going into the the business world and uh, the business sector. And then right now, the book I'm reading like is is a book by my mom recommended to me. Actually, it's it's super super simple finance book called um, Break Free from Broke, which is just simple financial decisions that you can make now leading into a uh, your adult life to make sure that you have a uh, prosperous future. So like how I said, like it's a kind of a, kind of a multitude of different things I like to read. I like to make sure that, uh, that my mind's kind of uh, being fed from different parts of it. And it's not like a one size fits all. I don't think anyone should just go and read only entrepreneur books, like just solely entrepreneur books. I mean, it's good to read them, but at the same time, switch it up a little bit, maybe read like a finance book or read a leadership book or read even a fantasy book. But I mean, if you're keeping your mind active, you're keeping your mind active, you're keeping it sharp because that allows you to kind of tune in with your public speaking skills, allows you to have, be able to make uh, decisions on the fly, things like that. So, I mean, Super important. I mean, I know you're a huge reader, so uh, I think uh, I think you probably have more recommendations than me. But those are just some of the key recommendations I've been uh, been having lately and been reading right now. So, yeah, uh, we obviously started this because I'm an avid reader. I've been reading for the past eight years, at least fifteen mm -hmm. books per year, and um, it's spot on spot on what you say. And uh, we try to emphasize this so much because I wish I would have started reading when I was still in high school and a hundred percent in such a pivotal moment that all of our student athletes are living where books are 
your haven to find new information, to connect with a with a higher self, not only with what you are, but if you're reading about someone you admire, you're going to fill your mind with possibilities, with real people doing the things you want to do. So it kind of becomes part of your reality and it really alters your, your thought process. And uh, thank you, man. I think it's great what you say. And I really like to emphasize how you not only read to read, but you read for a purpose. You read because you know it's going to help your communication skills. It's going to help you network. It's going to help you take better decisions. So so kind of highlighting what you say and and, uh, and just, just not, I'm not surprised that, you say this about reading, Carson, because it's directly correlated to how you speak, everything you've said, and obviously your your journey. And that's that's the main goal of us having these sessions is for them to listen to somebody that they just didn't give it to them. You have you had to build yourself up for it, and you had to step up to the occasion many times. And I know reading is not something you do for social media or you do when you're. Uh, before a game it's something you do in your free time it's something you do when you have other things to do but you consciously decide mm -hmm. to read so again also using this to call bs on everyone that ever says that they don't have time to read i, I was about to say that yeah <laughs> i don't think you don't have time to read you just don't have your your priority straight and uh carson now going more into the the sporting aspect of it uh i want to ask you this this question uh, that Amalia uh, here in the call asked, I think it's a good question. Um, in the leadership role that you stand on now, or well, did a couple months ago, um, what are some mm -hmm. advice that you would like to share to someone, someone that is trying to fill up that same role and be seen as an example to others? Yeah, I mean, I would say that there's a multitude of advice of advice. I think one of the most important things is not to be uh, discouraged if it doesn't happen right away. I mean, if you're trying to fill like one of those leadership roles or those captain roles, oftentimes it's never going to be just handed like off the first like attempt of it. I mean, like how I was saying before, it's a track record that you have to show that is proven uh, just a continuous show of being the best leader for yourself, being the best leader around you. And then it's one of those things that kind of happen naturally. Like for me, when I came into college, my sophomore year, I was, um, well, at the end of my freshman year, I was uh, put into the leadership council there. And uh, that was just due to the same thing I was saying. I mean, like, it was just a continuous effort to make sure that I was making, being the best version of myself. And then doing that allowed me to help pull others up. And I think that's something that people kind of forget. Like you want to help others so bad and you want to lead others so bad, but at the same time, the best thing you can do is make sure that you're in a really good place that allows you to naturally kind of help those others up around you. And I think um, I think going back to what I said, if it doesn't happen right away, it's not something to be discouraged about. I know there's plenty of leaders who kind of uh, emerge along their own time. One of the best leaders that I had on this leadership council with me didn't join our council until his end of his junior year because he had some time he needed to really work on things. But um, by the time he was ready for it, he had the, amount, like, the right amount of momentum. He had the right amount of um, buy-in from the locker room, from the people around him. And that was just due to the fact that he continuously worked on himself, continuously showed that he was striving to be better and continuously didn't just act like it because he wanted to be the leader, but did it because he wanted to better himself. So I think I think as long as you're moving forward and trying to better yourself and try to, and trying to push forward – with the with creating the best version of yourself i think naturally others will start to follow that and kind of take your lead for it but just don't get discouraged if it doesn't happen instantaneously just make sure that what you're doing is for the right reasons and that's because you want to be the best version of yourself not just because you want to lead others you know what i mean i hope that answered your question amaria and yes the if it doesn't if it doesn't feel free to feel free to ask any clarification i mean i i'm here that's what i'm here for Yes, yes, we'll we'll open up the conversation to to questions, but I just wanted to find the best questions and obviously answer a couple of them, sure. one of them, mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. I think that I think that every everything you you've told us, Carson, they can be uh, dissected from different angles, but I think you're you're transmitting the message, and I think that all of us are leaders. We don't need the captains captain's armband we don't have to be called a, a leader or the captain i think every one of us in our own position you as a defender you can be the leader of the defense you as a midfielder you can be the leader of the midfielders uh you as a 
you as an assistant coach, you, you can be, you know, you can be a leader in so many aspects of soccer. For example, me and Sebastian, maybe we're not playing anymore, but we're trying to be the leaders of our companies and our companies, they want to help athletes. So I think leadership, it transcends what you do, not only on the field, but outside of it. And I want to add there, Carson, to, uh, to the next question. Um, we've talked about talent. We've talked about grid dedication, but uh, Alan here has a really good question that I would like to ask, which is apart from individual talent, what would you say are key traits or characteristics that really helped you reach a D1 university? And I know um want to make a footnote here i know that you had a different path because obviously you went into an mls academy but talking as a as a athlete from an island you know not they're always going to look at the brazilians and spaniards and argentinians before you what would you say were those characteristics that helped you reach that that level that that you reach in terms of university play yeah, so I mean, this one is this one's a little bit more simple of an of an answer. I mean, two things that could really allow you to stand out amongst the crowd, because I'm sure, because the talent is the talent's not like a, the talent's obviously you need to be talented, which is how we're going off of it. But once you have the talent, what you really need to focus on is continuous work ethic. So constantly trying to improve, because I mean, like how I was saying, like with leadership as well, soccer itself is not. It's not just, okay, now I've arrived. Now I'm really good at soccer. I only need to, I only need to just do training kind of like half, half acid. I need to just do that. Like I, in the gym, I'm not going to do the gym. I don't need the gym, like things like that. Like when I got to, um, when I got to my college, I was pretty strong. I was probably the strongest guy in my academy, but at the same time you enter this new level and there's a lot more strong guys and a lot more big people inside of college. So my work ethic transmitted like every single gym session, I had to go harder than every single practice. I had to go harder than I had to be working harder. And if I just allowed myself to kind of rest on my laurels of uh, being content with where I was at coming out of high school and coming out of that academy experience, I would have never made it. Cause I've seen people come out of like good academies and just kind of, kind of, throw 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 everything away in a sense because they weren't really that weren't willing to have the continuous work ethic because there is a different step inside of the level there's a different little bit of a task but if you're willing to kind of meet it there i mean there's a reason why these coaches pick you because they see the potential in you you're never going to be the finished product of yourself the first week you walk on campus but if you're willing to continue pushing yourself to build yourself then that's a uh, that's a uh, that's something that they'll very very well look for i mean that somebody that's willing to continue working and continue seeing themselves as a project instead of like being the finished arrived pro product um the second thing i would say is just be extremely coachable coaches love the guy who's willing to listen who's willing to just do what they're told to do willing to really just push forward i mean me myself like this last season of my grad season i played i've been a, i was a four-year starter for high point as a center back this grad season my coach told me carson you're going to be a right back this season you know what I said? I said, all right, sounds great. I'm going to be a right back this season. The entire time. I mean, it was a new skill I learned, but it wasn't like, it wasn't, I argued, it wasn't no any argument back with him. It wasn't any pushback or anything like that. It was, this is what he thinks is going to be the best for the team. And then lo and behold, I had one of my best seasons. I mean, that was first team all conference. I've had a great season doing it. But I mean, besides the fact of that, even inside of your own position, like every coach is different. And if you believe that, what one of your coaches told you is always going to be the canon correct thing. I mean, you're wrong. Like if I always believed that my U16 Academy coach was the correct, the correct um, response about how I should position myself. Yeah. It might've been the correct response, um, how, I should, how I should position myself on that team. But once I got to stay a high point, then it was a different thing. He wanted me to position myself differently. And then that's, that's okay because there's different coaching methods. And if you're allowed, if you're allowed if you allow yourself to be willing and open with it and allow yourself to make mistakes because you're because uh, you're willing to be open with trying those new things, then coaches love to see that because coaches love to see the person that's willing to listen to them, willing to do what they're asked and willing to go above and beyond to make sure that what is the team's best interest is at hand rather than what you think your individual best interest is. So yeah, work ethic and coachability are, are the two biggest things I would say uh, I think most people find success with. Um. Alan, I'm not only going to ask you if that answered your question, but I would like to hear your opinion, uh, knowing that you are with Camilo and Joshua, you guys knew 
firsthand and saw that you were in the DR, a big fish in a small pond. And I know you guys had to face reality when you got to such a competitive program. So knowing what we've talked, how you've adapted and are working on your mindset, knowing that you really have to work hard, uh, how, how do these words resonate with what you have lived and what you're currently doing to really excel as a, as an athlete and, and keep progressing in progressing in your career as a student athlete, athlete in college? Uh, I mean, yeah, uh, um, we arrived last semester. It was, our obviously our first, um, experience being here. It um as Federico said, since we we were um let's say we were uh yeah big fishes in a small pond back in the DR, but when you come here you realize that uh you're you're nothing to say something um compared to others because um as previously Federico I believe said um coaches are gonna going to look first to the spanish here we have a lot of spanish people um they're going to look to the brazilians and all those um first world countries so yeah it was it was honestly a, a struggle um uh, and then yeah um for example um this uh new year um i've been working a lot for example on my mindset um work ethic and everything and it's something that i believe unless you haven't experienced um like that uh low point you're not really going to be able to maybe understand it enough so yeah i mean for example in my um experience recently i've been since like i said i've been working on my mindset work ethic and during practices, I've been, you know, giving it my all. And uh, yeah, for example, just, I mean, we're starting spring, no, well, kind of started already spring semester, but um, there has been a massive improvement in my case. Uh, I mean, I, I went from being the JV team and I uh, finally got the, the, an opportunity to play um, one of the recent games with varsity and uh, yeah i've noticed i mean like you said the coachability um asking my coach um what can i do better um this game uh in practice in general and yeah it's just something that i believe unless you haven't you have experienced it you will understand and yeah it's just a lot about uh, continuous work and giving your everything. And yeah. Yeah, bro. I mean, I completely agree. Go ahead. I don't know. I was going to ask Joshua, who's next to him, his experience and how that answer that you gave, you know, resonated on him. Oh, well, the, the answer for me is like a confirmation because um as alan said last semester was really rough um they saw like all the first country players and we thought that we were gonna play all games that we we're gonna start but it wasn't like that so um like alan said this semester was different and once you experience that low point, you can't realize, you can see the things that you need to work on and really like improved. I haven't been that lucky because I have, I have had a concussion and I couldn't play, but yeah, like I, I've seen also improvement in my practices, the, uh, the games, the scrimmages that we do and yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm completely hearing what you guys say about that low point. I mean, for me, like I've definitely had that confirmation from the low point as well. My second year inside of um the MLS Teams Academy, I almost got dropped from being on the team. I went from being a starter my first year that I got there 
to not start. I think I started like one or two games my second year there and they were threatening to drop me. But I mean, at the, like close to the end of it, like I ended up putting my ego to the side and really becoming coachable and putting that work ethic in. And that allowed me to, to just barely get my spot sign, signed for the next year. And then that next year is when I really kind of blew up. So, I mean, it was a lot of those things of, of having to grow up a little bit and having to put your pride aside a little bit and maybe thinking like, okay, what am I really not doing right here? Or like, what can I really improve on? And kind of looking within yourself of what can I do better? Cause I mean, for me, like in my mind, the first half of that season so long ago, now it feels like but that first half of the season, the only thing in my mind was coaches, coaches making a mistake. Coaches don't know what he's doing. Like I'm way better than like these people. And then I had to really look inward and really watch film and really think like, Am, is coach making a mistake or am I really just not putting the performances I think I'm putting out there? And then that shifted the mindset, like how you guys said inside of a loan point and then shifted the work ethic and I mean, allowed me to save my spot barely that year. But I mean, the next year doesn't happen without that. The next year doesn't happen without yet. And then none of the college stuff happens without that little shift of uh, that paradigm shift and mentality and things like that. So, I mean, I completely hear what you guys are saying with having to experience that low point to kind of have that confirmation to, to move forward. And to add on what you said, I feel like when you face that adversity and there's two types of players, the ones that are that have the victim mentality, which is blaming everyone else, and the ones that said, okay, am I doing the right thing or what can I do to improve, you know, and take action? And I think those are the ones that get way farther than the ones that have a victim mentality, you know, because it's it's about taking ownership of the situation and taking ownership of your actions. And I it happened to me the same thing. You know, I, I went from a JUCO to a D2 school my first year, and I thought I was really good. When I got there, I just played like three games as a sub, you know, and going to be, going from being the star of your JUCO to going to that D2 and not playing at all, you know, it, it hurts your ego and your vanity, you know, you, you feel like they're making a mistake, but like you said, you have to watch a lot of film and really ask yourself the, the right questions. And that feels, it, it, yeah, I was going to say, it feels so good to just sit in that victim mentality inside of it. It's the easiest thing you can do just to, to really just pass it off of like, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they're doing. Like, I'm like, I'm way better than that. Because it's so easy to just have that confirmation with yourself because it, it strokes your ego and strokes your pride. I mean, the hardest thing you can do is put your pride aside and think like, okay, really, what is the situation here? Because I mean, it's the easiest thing to just slump into that victim mentality, how you were saying, Seba, of just allowing it like, oh yeah, no, it's, it's their fault. It's not my fault. It couldn't be something I'm doing. Exactly. And I had to change my mindset. It's the, I'm super thankful I was able to do it at a young age. But if I continued down that road that I had there, I mean, I probably wouldn't even made it to the college level, which is a scary thought to think about. Definitely. And, and that helped me so much in, you know, after after college in, you know, real life, knowing that, hey, it's not everyone else's fault. It's my fault and I got to do something about it. And, you know, I, I learned how to take ownership of those type of situations. And nowadays, I, I, I'm happy that it happened to me at that time. You know, like, I, I'm glad that I went through that because I, I feel like I, as, you know, as a professional, you know, being in the professional world, working on highlights, you know, it it just makes me unstoppable because I know it's it's I, I it's my decision to go where I want to be. No one it's not it doesn't depend on anyone anyone else. It's on me. So I, I feel like those type of situations when you face adversity and you take action and you don't have that victim mentality is what makes you progress as a as you know, as an adult and as a as a real human being and as a leader. So I, I really like that answer that you gave. But do you have any other questions from the from the boys and the girls? Yes, I um I also want wanted to add Carson on what you said earlier about being coachable <laughs> if I could save up five words to put into a time box coachability would be one for me because it has it has just been key to a lot of the things I have done in my life being coachable and I wanted to talk about the example of Brandon Bai he participated in one of our sports mm -hmm. leadership and a good friend of mine, and he's been part of, of just everything we've been building for a lot of years. And he 
had a very special case. He finished off his senior year of high school, of college. Um, Western got to the Sweet 16. They ranked number seven. He got he got a call to the MLS Combine Camp, and he was he was signed up as a forward or right uh, right wing. And the first day, one coach told him, "Hey, you should try out as a right back, and I think you're gonna have more possibility." And at the moment, he could have been like, "No, fuck off. I'm I'm Brandon By. Mm -hmm. I scored 12 goals and I took my team to the national championship." But he was like, "Okay," and now he's in his seventh year as a professional player for the New England Revolution, specifically as a right back. So mm -hmm. it's uh it's very good that you say that because. There's big scale, like going to the MLS, but I think just appreciating the coachability in your day to day just opens up so many doors to new relationships, to new opportunities. So I uh, wanted to emphasize on that, on that point that you said of, of coachability. And I hope you guys really research what the word is, because it's not something they're going to teach you in college. Nobody's going to really put a grade on it. It's something that is going to determine your quality as a human being and as an athlete, as a student and everything you, you try to become in life. And Carson, feeding off what you said about uh, the situation you had when you were part of that uh, academy that you barely played your second year, I want to ask you a question that Axel here wrote, which I think is a really good one, is how you how do you mental, mentally handle when you have had a long streak of bad performances? Wow, yeah, what a question. I mean there's a there's a lot of depth in this one. So for me, like um like how I was saying those uh those years where I was having those bad performances, I guess when I was younger, I handled it terribly. Mentally my head was all over the place and it was a uh, it was honestly a disaster. I mean, I was living thousands of miles from home with people who weren't my actual family. I mean, like it was victim blaming. It was all this. It was, it was everything that you can imagine. There was tears, there was frustration, there was anger. There was being like being a dick at practice, just like literally just being the worst possible version I could possibly be. And that was the complete wrong thing. That's like the, the complete opposite of what you want to do. But it's one of those things where you need to go through something like that to kind of to kind of uh to kind of grow up a little bit i mean something similar happened to me when i was a sophomore at high point as well like i mean i went through a string of bad performances and they um and it was frustrating it was super frustrating it was a uh one of those things where it's just like i can't believe this is happening at the same time like covid was going on there was a lot of a lot of frustrations inside of the air things like that and i didn't handle it that great either and like i said like i'm gonna be completely transparent i wasn't the greatest the greatest teammate at that point either and it was one of those resurgences it was almost a relapse of how I used to act and um thankfully for me I went to a uh I went to a really good well one I had a um one I had a sports psychologist who was there as well who was um I was very thankful to have that as well I mean I'm not sure everyone has that access access to that but she allowed me to um to put some practices into place that I took with me into the USL team I played in that next summer which I had one of the best summers of my life in but it was one of the things that she told me that really allowed me to um to push forward which was you need to separate the person from the performance so for me a lot of that anger and a lot of that frustration came from the fact that I was Carson Kendall the soccer player and I didn't know how to separate it like so when I had a bad performance I was not I wasn't just taking it as oh I had a bad performance at playing soccer it was I'm a bad person I'm, I'm, I'm just the worst. Like I'm letting everybody down. Like I'm not a good person. I'm not like everyone's disappointing me. Every time I showed up into that training, I was, I was in defense mode because like in my mind, I'm thinking, Oh, everyone hates me. They, they think I'm bad. They think I'm playing bad. Like they probably hate me as like a person, things like that. But what my sports psychologist, what she taught me is that, listen, soccer at the end of the day is just a game. It's a game you play. It's not you. I mean, it's part of your identity. Sure. Like, but you are so much more than just the sport you play. And hearing those words resonated with me so much because that allowed me to take so much pressure off of the performance. Because for me, like if I was playing good, I was doing good in life. If I was playing bad, I was doing bad in life. It didn't matter what I was doing at school. It didn't matter what I was doing at like with my relationships and my friendships. It was, if I'm playing bad, then, then I'm a bad person. If I'm playing good, then I'm a good person. Everything in the world's great. 
but those words and like the the practices you put in place for me was really allowing for me to really just let it be what it is. The 90 minutes is the 90 minutes. Take it for what it is. I'm not saying just do the 90 minutes and forget about the game, like digest it, think about film and things like that, but really separate it from it's a game of soccer. And now I'm going to go live my life and be a human being, which is, I, which is, this is the same exact advice I told all the younger guys. Once I became a bit of an older and bit of a leader on, on my college team is, is there's going to be bad performances. There's going to be good performance. At the end of the day, we play a high intensity, a high level, a high, a high team sport, like where you have to rely on other people on that. And there's going to be good days. And there's going to be bad days. There's not a single person that goes through an entire season, whether that's college, high school, professional, where every single game they have is a 10 out of 10 performance. I mean, there's some people who have a bit more consistent performances than other and like don't have a bad game like that often, but people are going to have bad games. And it's how you separate the game and the performance from who you are as a person, which really allows you to allow you to push forward. So for me, that also took doing things for myself that was good for my mental health outside of soccer and things like that. Like I do yoga, I, well, I do still do it. I do yoga now, I meditate. Like how you said, I read, I find other passions outside of soccer that allow me to just have soccer be part of my life and that performance, I can die, I can dissect it as it's my job. Like, it's my job. Like, okay, I didn't do great at this. And I can look, literally look at it analytically. Like, okay, it looks like I got beat because I stepped like here, not because I'm a bad person or I'm not a good person or something like that. Like, I, like, I don't take it as much of a weight like that. So my advice to you is to just take the performance what it is, dissect it analytically, think about what you did bad and bad and good from it as a soccer player but once you're done doing that don't let it weigh on you like just move on with your day move on with your life and then the next day you come to practice be refreshed have it inside your mind like okay this is what i need to do better do inside of it but don't take it as this existential dread with you carrying around like oh my gosh everybody people who weren't even people who don't even know you played a soccer game like i was doing that to me i'd go to a restaurant i'd be like thinking like oh my gosh like they know i played bad these people don't even know i played soccer and I'm taking that with me to a restaurant to go have dinner with like people who don't even care, my host family. Like, it's like one of those things where it's, I really needed to grow up and kind of learn in the sense that like, it is a game we play and it's a sport that we love. But at the end of the day, like I'm Carson Kendall and I'm not Carson Kendall, the soccer player. Once I leave the soccer thing, I can take my soccer player jacket off once I leave the locker room and then move on with my day and my life and I'll be okay. Holy shit, this is great, man. Sorry for the word. Um, <laughs> no, no, you're good. I think this is just a pure value. This is coming. I feel, man, everything you're saying have come from a lot of years of personal development, self-awareness. And uh, what you say about the sports psychologist, man, I think, and I'm sure that it was a decision that you voluntarily made because you knew you needed help. And I think a lot of us athletes, we are so used to be given everything. We're told where to go, where to train, how to train, what to lift, what to eat, that we forget that we are human beings and we forget that we are the CEO of our own company, say us as human beings. And I think that strategic decision of reaching out uh, for help, of open, opening yourself up, I think it's such an important attribute in your growth as an athlete and as a human being. So really, really grateful that you bring that up because I know everyone on this call, we're e we're always fighting our demons. We're always fighting what we have here in our head, which we can't escape from unless we die. But I think that uh, reaching out, uh, just as you say, Carson, for help, and doesn't necessarily have to be to a sports psychologist, but just somebody that has lived what you have gone through or even having that uh, those teammates or those friends that you can really reach out to and here's what i really want to emphasize on not reach out as you say carson the soccer player but carson the person because really you're you played soccer a small percentage of your life but now you are turning 24 and you're going to live 60 more years and those 60 more years all the medals you gain all the trophies or all, all the accolades they're only going to gather dust. And now is where you really start a life where people are going to know you for your name, 
your last name, your values, and what what you bring to the table. So I think uh, I'm really glad that you brought that up in terms of uh, reaching out to a sports psychologist. And here uh, we have Javier. Javier is uh, is a director of our, our lifting program, our strength program. And Javier, just as Seba, just as me, we all do our things and we're not sports psychologists, but I think we have shown our our players that we're here for them and that we're not only here to help them become better players or to get recruited or to lift more but we're here to listen to really connect because we either walked where they have walked or we know people like you that's why we're bringing you to this call that have lived what they are going to live or or they want to live so so I think it's so important that you say that, man, because we're not alone in this. Sometimes we think we are. Sometimes we think, even as you say, the the waiter at the restaurant is going to ask you about your soccer game, but realistically, they don't even know. And even if they did, the role in their in their life at the moment is to be the best server as they can, not ask Carson how he did in his in his soccer game. So. So thank you, man, for those great insights. And I have one last question, and then I would like to, um, whoever wants to ask a question to do the hand raise on, on the call, just so uh, we know how many want to ask a question. And my question, Carson, and this is a question I ask you, is what would you tell your 15-year-old self if you could sit down in front of him and have a conversation? What... What's that one piece of advice you would tell yourself at that age? Yeah, if I could tell myself anything, this one's this one's honestly a no-brainer. It's it's have humility in every aspect of your life, have humility. Because at the end of the day, you're better than nobody, nobody's better than you. But at the like it's the best you could the best way you can live your life is just being as humble as possible, having as much humility as possible having as much grace as possible but really humility is just really really is really the number one thing because if i had a bit more humility when i was 15 i think i could have gone far i mean i'm very grateful for where i got now i think i could have gone farther than where i was then because that humility and that coachability all that stuff that i learned throughout the way which is super important life lessons to me that's what really allowed me to strive as a person and as a soccer player. The performances got better having that humble approach, having that humility approach. Everything got better. That everything in my life, my relationships, my family relationships, my my um serious relationships with my girlfriend and things like that. Like everything got better the more humble and the more humility I had. Because as soon as that pride gets in the way of of I want to be right, I want to be right, I want to do this, like I'm this, I'm that, I'm that, that's when you start to stray up, like stray from from the path that you're on. So my best advice to y'all and my advice that I give to my 15 year old self is just go out every aspect with humility. And especially, especially because you also don't know what other people are going through in life. So just go with them to grace, go meet them with grace, meet them where they're at, talk to them where they're at. Don't try to be all prideful. Don't try to put yourself on a pedestal above anybody. Just go straight and narrow with the humility. So yeah, super straightforward, super simple answer with that one. But it's it's something that over the years I think is been the most important thing with me of everything that I've done is just to be humble and have that humility. Have you read the book Ego is the Enemy? No, but uh, I mean, it sounds like one I should read. Yeah, um, I we have a couple of uh, of people in this call that have read the book. I know Adriana read the book, and Adriana, I don't know if you have any questions for Carson, but. Tell her about tell him about your experience with the book. What have you learned and how what he tells you probably resonates with a lot of the things. Uh, Carson being one of the athletes, obviously not as the as the ones they mentioned in the book. Like they talk about Tiger Woods, for example. Mm-hmm. But I think we don't have to be Tiger Woods level to really know that we're at an athlete. We were a kid with a dream. We were a kid with issues and you know, to the level that what we got, different spectrums, but we follow the same path, even as the grades. Uh, yeah, I read that book because I think Seba sent it in one of our group chats and I I loved it. It's probably my favorite book. Um, and something similar to what you just said about being coachable and, and everything, that book mentions that it's important to always be and stay a student. You never know if the person next to you 
has something to offer um, to, to your life in general. I mean, always staying a student is very important. And also when it comes to failure, um, speaking of victimizing yourself that you mentioned earlier, you have two options. You either can try to take advantage of your situation and see it as a lifetime, which is uh, the phrase that the book used, or dead time. So if you pick to be alive, is to take the time or the situation in front of you and start working towards your goals um, instead of victimizing or whining or crying about what's happening. So I think the book is, is extremely great um, for you to learn in all aspects of life, success, failure. Um, I think you should read it, but I'm very grateful for your conversation. It's been great. Um, I wanted to know if you had uh, what was like the best skill or um, value that you learned being the captain of your national team that you could further on use in your college experience? Yeah, I mean, when you say skill, do you mean like literal skill playing soccer or like just like like just skill? No, just a personal skill uh, okay. or value. Yeah. I think the I think the best skill that I learned being a in a captain role at a young age is um, in the communication aspect of it. Uh, there's not one size fits all with every player. You can't approach player A like how you approach player B or player C. Like some people need tough love, some people need that hand around their shoulder, some people need that that kind of direct communication. Some people need to be talked to um, after the fact. Some people need to be talked to during the fact. Like I mean there's no one way to communicate with everybody. And then once you learn that, once you learn that you need to kind of put into practice learning how people's characteristics are and how their traits are and what you can do to kind of help them succeed, I mean, it, it helps you tenfold. You can take that anywhere you go, even if it's on the field or off the field. This the ability to talk to people and meet them where they're at and meet them at the at what they need is, uh, is a really important thing. Because once you start doing that, then people will start looking at you as a person who can understand people, how can communicate people, has emotional intelligence. So yeah, communication skills, just learning that not it's not one size fits all. You can't just be the same, same Carson that you are with every single person all the time. I mean, you can be genuine, you can be fake, like all the you can be genuine and all that, but like on the field, off the field, like some people just need different things and that's okay. Thank you for your question. Great, great uh, intervention. Thank you, Adriana. Carson, I have that book in PDF. I can send it over if you would like yeah, to. Yeah, send that to me for sure. Yeah, I'm sure you're gonna, I'm sure you're gonna vibe with it. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, guys, I don't know, and girls, I don't know who else has a question or a comment. I think now is, uh, is the time. We've been here for an hour. Really want to thank Carson for all the facts you have spitted. Um, I think it's I'm glad we're recording this because we'll be able to get some shorts and clips out of this just so your wisdom keeps going. I know there's a lot of uh, boys and girls from the USVI that maybe we should do another one of these and invite them because uh, I'm mm -hmm. sure we are always looking to give back. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot. I'll get you in touch with some people for sure. Yeah, definitely. I, I know because you know, we've had mass eight twice here. We, we've we seen the, the young fellows. When, well, when you were here, you were one of the young ones, you know, even if you were mm -hmm. a leader. So, so yeah, man, one, uh, one again, uh, thank you for that. And I see, uh, Javi, you have your, uh, your hand up. So go ahead, brother. Yeah. Hi, Carson. Um, thank you for joining us today and for taking the time to share with us. My name is Javier. Um, but my friends call me Javi. Um, I love sports since I was a little kid. I used to play soccer and um, I dreamt of going out of the DR through through sport, through the sport. However, I made some decision that led me down a different path. So currently I'm a physical therapist and um, I'm a performance coach. I'm in charge of the, of the highlights lifting program. So I train th these guys a few times a week at 5 a.m. We are um, trying to uh, make them stronger, keep them injury free and boost their performance and the, uh, their self-esteem. So, yeah, I resonate with everything you said. I think that's the energy we all need coming from small islands in the Caribbean. Um, you spoke about 
uh, growth, which com comes with challenges. You spoke about work ethic, humility, leadership, discipline, and, and how the sport will aid you on your, on your next journey. And um, I believe that's what we all need to keep in mind at all times in order to succeed on bigger stages. And I believe my values and my habits have shaped me into a better person. And I give that credit. Um, I give the credit to my athlete spirit for that. So, yeah, I love everything you said. Um, thank you so much for being, um, for taking your time to share with us. And um, yeah, hope to hear from you again soon. All right, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. And I, I mean, I appreciate you, what you're doing for all these young people. And I mean, if I could say one thing about, about lifting coaches is take them serious. I know plenty of people who think lifting is not part of soccer, but it is. I mean, and it sounds like you have a holistic approach to it. So just take it serious, take the gym serious because it prevents you from having injuries. I've seen too many people, too many people have career any injuries at too young of an age because they don't take it serious. So, I mean, I'm super appreciative for what you're doing for these guys and, uh, really helping develop people from a young from a young age on a small island i mean it's super important i wish i had somebody like you in that position to teach me how to lift when i was i you know in freshman year of high school before i left and went to the states inside of the islands so thank you and i appreciate you appreciate you all allowing me to be here i mean i'm really appreciative to uh, have this conversation as well it's it's very uh eye-opening for me to just talk to people who i was like i was in the same exact position years ago so it's it's something really cool full circle well, we appreciate your time and you know before we end the meeting i would just like to give a quote from a book that i think it's one of my favorites it's called meditations i know adriana is reading it right now as well and it's it's from marcus aurelius by the yeah by the philosopher Mark, yeah, marcus aurelius read it? i haven't read it but my my um no my my roommate last year had it and he was telling me to read it but i never got around to it so and maybe i should uh read it good changed my life and there's a quote that I want to you know just throw out there for everyone and it's it says waste no more time wondering what a good man should be and just be one sometimes we we are asking ourselves like, what what should I do when we already know the answer and I know all of the guy all of the girls and all of the guys here they know what they need to do to get to that level they know what they need to do to become a better athlete, a better person. But sometimes our ego and our pride and vanity just doesn't let us see what's after that. You know, what's the, it just allows us to see the problem right there. And when you you give yourself that opportunity to just see what's next and don't focus on the problem, you know, it allows you to you know, to be a better person. And it, it changed my life, that quote. So, you know, I even have it as my background right here. I don't know if you can see it, but yeah, that's, Adriana, when you get to that point, you, you know, just make sure you highlight it. So, yeah, I know Felipe has his sign up. So go ahead, Felipe. Um, So I have a, a question and I want to know, like, some tips that, well, you can give me to like balance my school life my social life and like my and sports life as a kid like sometimes let's say you have a let's say you're, you're invited to a party but like the next day you have training so like i want to know some tips that you can give me like to know how to balance my my overall like my social life school life and like my sports life in general yeah i mean if you want to hear a good tip you should uh just go back 30 seconds, listen to what Seba just said about that quote about don't waste time being a good man. Just do it. I mean, things like that, like being a high level athlete is a, it's a commitment. And unfortunately, like a lot of times it does mean that social life, um, all that does suffer a little bit due to the fact that you have to put a lot of work into this and a lot of uh, things and things go into this realistically though. Like, I mean, it's all about just finding the balance of it. I mean, social life has to be part of it. Like you can't go your whole life just being only soccer and the only interactions you have with are the teammates you see every single day, but you just have to find time for it and find time in a healthy way. I mean, realistically, for me, when I lived in Kansas City, I, I had the craziest, I guess the craziest alternate lives at 
if that makes sense, because I, I lived with the host family and I went to a normal public school. We all went to normal public schools. So I just go to my school and then I had my friends at my school and then I just would go to practice. And when it was time to practice, it was time to turn on. And when it was time to, and it was time to uh, fly out on the weekends and play those games, it was all seriousness. I mean, it's one of those things. It's how much are you willing to put in and the sacrifice you wouldn't put in to have that kind of at the end of the tunnel, because you're never going to be able to go to the party the next day you have game or training. You're never going to be able to do that. It's just not going to work. Like, I can't give you a solution for that because there's just no real solution to that. The solution is you don't go to the party, you sleep in and go to the, go to the game and make sure you're fresh for it. But at the same time, when those times do arise and those rare occasions that you have the ability to have the off weekend and there is a party and there's friends to be seen and hang out with, just go out and have a good time, do it in a responsible way. I mean, you have to have that good balance, but I mean, make sure you're putting all the effort in and doing the right thing when you have to. And then when you have the rewards, take the rewards for what they are. Cause we're all high level athletes here or we're high level, high level athletes here. I mean, you know what you need to do, but at the same time, don't have it consume your life. If there's an off weekend and it's the first off weekend you've had in a month, you don't need to go by yourself to the field and train for nine hours. You need to enjoy yourself and have yourself a, a normal time, whether that's just hanging out with friends or maybe having a little bit of a cheat meal or something like that. But when it's time to be in, it's time to work, it's a job, it's time to work. I mean, that's the best thing I could say because you have to make some sacrifices to be able to be successful, but at the same time, you can't only solely focus on that because you'll get burnt out, if that makes sense. I hope that answered your question a little bit. I hope that wasn't too, uh, too roundabout. Oh, yes, yes, it did. Thank you. No, thank you. I appreciate you. Yeah, and I think that's uh, Felipe is a sophomore still in, in high school. And I think right now he's in that pivotal stage where just like you in high school, all of his friends want to go out, want to stay till late. But he has a goal. He has a dream. So I think what you say, Carson, is very spot on. What do you want and how bad do you want it? Because you, you can't say you want to be a D1 athlete and you don't behave like it. And I don't think you have to tell him what you did every minute of the day because just by your words and your repertoire, which I also think that, Felipe, if you if you look at yourself as Carson today, if you look at your 23-year-old self saying you've accomplished everything, playing D1, you know, just like I know you want to play D1, I know you want to get far in your collegiate uh, career, just look at Carson and be like, what did Carson do when he was at your age that helped him get to to where to where he got and I think that that also that it's always a good way to really like find peace with the sacrifices you have to make as an athlete because when all of your friends are going one way you go the other way today because tomorrow you're going to be somewhere they're not going to be able to be because they didn't do the the work that you did put in and I think that it's not only for soccer that's for life and that's uh that's one thing I think that you said at the beginning, going into the corporate world, you're very sure that the attributes and the skill set that you learned as an athlete, they're not going to judge you in your job because you get uh, 10 assists per season, but they are going to judge your humane character. They're going to judge, you know, whatever position you're in, what are your, your KPIs, what, what are the goals you have to reach every quarter? I think it's like that strategic mindset it starts today. It, it doesn't start when you're already getting the job. It started 10 years ago when you made the decision to be elite. And 10 years ago, it was to get into MLS Academy, get good grades, get recruited. You know, like your goals have evolved. But I do know you've also evolved as a person, but you've all, always been very clear of the sacrifice that you have to do, because I think that's that's a non-negotiable. That's something that it doesn't really get easier. Trust me, I'm turning I'm turning 30 in a year, and I hope I was 17 again because my problems <laughs> were way easier than the ones I'm <laughs> technically I'm technically facing. And uh, Carson, I I think man, we've received so much wisdom and knowledge that I would like to wrap it up. Um, I think it's been amazing for me. It's been it's just incredible to hear you, man, because. Uh, I know what you have gained, learned, won, lost has been all due to your vision, to your work ethic. And and man, let, let's keep this ball rolling. If 
we want to do this again with more kids of the USVI, we can set up the platform, have a kind of same structure. Because I think many your words are very inspiring. I think how you communicate things it's, is something that I hope everyone looks at it, not only with what you're saying, but how you're saying it. Because if I look at your transfer market profile, I'm like, oh my God, this is a good soccer player. But I'm listening to a leader. I'm listening to a good human being. And I know I'm I'm listening to a, a future businessman and a future good husband, a future good person for society, man. So so I think that, man, I hope everything you've said also gives you that pat on the back to keep going. I know you're facing challenges. I know you're putting yourself in a position of growth and discomfort. So, man, I hope that everything you say and the admiration these guys feel for you, you really embrace it because you deserve, man, every every one of the good things you've gotten. And uh, for, for the group, I, I want to thank you and know that uh, as highlights, we really value you as a person, as an athlete, and know that we can count on you to give back that wisdom, man. We're, we're really grateful. So I don't know if you want to add anything else, man, but, yeah, but then no, again, I mean, that's all you have to say, brother. I uh, want to thank you from my end, from Seba's end, Javi's and and all of our team for taking the time to do this. Yeah, the only thing I could say at the end of it is just thank you guys so much for taking time out of your guys' night to, to be here and listen to to what I have to say. It's a humbling experience that I'm able to even just kind of talk to you guys about my journey and talk to you about the things that I've been able to face and that you guys um, you guys are willing to, especially um, especially you three, are willing to put some faith into me to talk to these young people and, um, and uh, kind of share my experiences. And for the, all the young people in here, I mean, I'm thankful that you guys took this time out of your nights because I know it's no, it's not easy being young, having this busy schedule and all things like that to, to listen to me. And uh, I mean, if I could leave it with one thing, I'll say the quote I said again at the at the start of it is um, the way you do um, anything is the way you do everything. Just live your life by that. And I mean, every time you wake up, just think about that. Keep that in the back of your mind. But again, I mean, I wish you guys nothing but success on your journey. And I'm, I'm really excited to see where you guys all go. Um, yeah, I mean, if you guys ever need to reach out to me to ask me any questions, uh, uh, Pedrico has my um, has my WhatsApp. I'm no longer on Instagram or anything like that. I'm done with, I don't really do the social media anymore. So if you guys need to reach out to me, feel free to. I mean, I'm here to answer questions. And uh, yeah, no, I wish you guys nothing but success. Thank you guys again. Well, thank you, Carson. Uh, I just wanted to say we're really grateful for you taking the time to do this. And as athletes that we are here, we respect you for your journey and for everything that you have accomplished. So thank you for, for sharing that experience. And I just have to say, we hope to have you here soon again. Yeah, for sure. Just let me know the time. All right. Thank All right, guys. Enjoy. All right. Thank y'all. See you guys. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.